and then starts. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the the second live session of uh, uh, the Inpital online certification course of uh, the building of advanced sized and steel for automotive applications. So, so the the first less the live session response was very good. So we thought, okay, so let's um, uh, do one more live session uh, to answer uh, some of your uh, uh, questions, and uh, we'll also discuss uh, the assignment four, uh, which we didn't discuss last time because last time the assignment four was still um, uh, active. Uh, so meanwhile, you know, if uh, how if you have any questions, uh, and you can also ask in the YouTube chats window. We'll try to answer uh, uh, those questions as well. Um, uh, we also received some of uh, uh, the questions from uh, the students. So we'll also discuss uh, that uh, uh, meanwhile. Um, so we'll uh, start with uh, the questions we received uh, using uh, the Google uh, forum. Okay, so the first question is uh, from um, YV Krishnam Raju. Uh, he asked the question about uh, the what are the precautions uh, we need to take while welding uh, duplex steels and hyaloid steels, etc. Okay, um, like I mean, uh, in, in in a way, the, the duplex steels and hyaloid steels are not commonly used for automotive applications. But uh, see, probably he wanted to know about uh, the welding metallurgy, the difficulties in welding of duplex stainless steel is probably for his work. We will still discuss that because it's also interesting uh, for uh, some of you if you're uh, using those steels uh, for uh, various applications. For example, deep steel applications are uh, now commonly used for uh, uh, some of the structural applications where we need uh, uh, high corrosion as well as um, uh, yeah uh, surface uh, um, aesthetics. Uh, so uh, the welding of stainless steel itself, you know, it is very challenging in general. Uh, except uh, the austenitic stainless steels of 316 uh, or 314. And if you take uh, the any other uh, uh, compositions, it can be very challenging. Uh, the main issue with uh, stainless steel uh, uh, welding metallurgy of stainless steel is um, hot cracking. Hot cracking can be significantly you know, uh, affecting the weld metal properties. Um, and um, uh, uh, stainless steel also they have a uh, unique uh, problem. It's known as sensitization. Right, and the sensitization uh, uh, ha happens in, in, a, in a given uh, temperature window uh, from say 500 to 850 degrees centigrade. Uh, whenever the peak temperature reached uh, in the heat of winter zone uh, between 500 to 850 degrees centigrade, uh, and so you uh, uh, generally you know uh, if the weld is used without any post weld heat treatment, uh, yeah, these welds are uh, prone for uh, sensitization. Okay, or a knife line attack. Uh, and apart from that, you know, the main precaution uh, we have to take um, uh, while welding duplex stainless steel is uh, selection of uh, proper filler. If you are uh, doing an angus metal arc welding. Okay, so there are some questions. Uh, the dual pulsing will create grain distribution. Okay, so there are some questions about uh, whether du dual pulsing will create grain distributions. Uh, uh, it's question about um, so dual pulsing. Uh, so dual pulsing will. Uh, I presume the the question is about grind distribution. So grind distribution. Uh, See, so uh, I, I suppose the the question is whether it will change the grind boundary area fraction, isn't it? So, uh, so in dual pulsing, basically in the second pulse we completely melt at the well nugget uh, at the center. Right, so if uh, the well nugget uh, is molten, so you would expect an, uh, a solidified microstructure at the center of the weld. So it is not going to change the grain distribution or grain size distribution. Okay, so uh, it would only affect uh, the, uh, the segregation because we are applying an, a, a sort of an postural heat treatment uh, in the uh, the prior uh, uh, interface. So, for example, I'll just to, um, go to the. Yeah. Uh, if you look at uh, the the classes, uh, what I was talking about in a dual pulsing, so you have an uh, interface created. Uh, the well nugget is created at the well interface. Sir, one second. Yeah.
Okay. So we have uh, an, uh, a resistance spot welding. So you imagine, so you make a, a well nugget. Okay, so this is your uh, primary uh, well nugget. Suppose if you're applying second pulsing, so you would end up melting uh, 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 the center part of the, uh, the primary well nugget, which you formed during pulse pulsing. So you'll have a secondary well nugget that is formed. And during this process, uh, you would uh, only homogenize the micro uh, the, uh, the elemental segregation not the well central line okay so if this homogenization is happening that means that uh, this area is not brittle anymore and therefore when you are applying an, an tensile load the crack would be deflected along uh, the prior uh, fusion boundary so, so you wouldn't expect an ideal change in gain structure because anyway, so what the heating rate, what you are applying uh, here is also an extremely high. Similarly, cooling rate, if you look at uh, you know, the, some of the uh, lectures I showed you, uh, it can be you know, as high as uh, uh, 1,000 to you know, 2,000 Kelvin per second. So such a rapid uh, heating and cooling conditions, you wouldn't expect the grind structure to change. But the diffusion rate of uh, the alloying elements are, uh, are high enough at temperatures and, and close to a melting point. So you would expect uh, a, a change in the segregation. Uh, the grind structure uh, may not change. I hope that, that answers your query. Yeah. OK. Uh, that's fine. So we'll go back to the uh, uh, duplex steel weld. So in duplex steel weld, generally duplex stainless steels, uh, the microstructures generally are the austenitic ferritic or austenitic uh, martensitic. Okay, so the various duplex stainless steels you may expect. Uh, so one of the, the precautions you need to take to avoid the hot cracking uh, issue is uh, the solidification mode of uh, the stainless steel. And so for example, if you have a, 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 a phase diagram of a stainless steel, so generally we use an iron chromium phase diagram. So for example, chromium changes from say 10 to uh, 30%. And the temperature okay so typical phase diagrams looks like uh, like this I'll just uh, take a reference okay so what do you have here liquid in this case liquid plus austenite and you may also have a nickel ranging from 20 to 10 for example high nickel so this side is high nickel that means that you have an austenitic microstructure. In this case, you have a high chromium. So you have a ferritic microstructure. And we also have some sigma phase formed uh, somewhere over here. And so this is liquid plus ferrite. Okay, so, and this is a three phase region. Okay, so, so what you have to aim for it uh, in a duplex stainless steel weld, you choose a filler in such a way that your weld metal primarily solidifies as a ferrite. So you will have a solidification uh, path, so which will be following something like this okay so primarily what you have to do is you have to solidify uh, the well metal into a ferrite and then later you once uh, you subsequently cool to room temperature so you may end up getting a two-phase microstructure of uh, uh, ferrite and austenite so this is uh, important because uh, the the sulfur induced hot cracking is a big problem Okay, so the uh, when the sulfur is partitioned to the liquid metal, uh, and subsequently, you know, when uh, you have a solidification is happening, the ferrite or uh, the sulfur uh, can induce uh, uh, hard cracking at the solidification grain boundary. Is a change in grain size that it changes into like final course. Okay, so we'll uh, get back to that. Uh, we'll uh, finish that. So when the the sulfur segregates. Uh, so sulfur is the element uh, which try to partition to the uh, ferrite, uh, then yeah, so liquid. So when the ferrite uh, 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 get enriched in uh, sulfur when doing solidification, okay, so the uh, uh, the unsolidified liquid is not enriched uh, sufficiently with sulfur. So that means that uh, when you are solidifying liquid to ferrite first, 
Okay? So you reduce the uh, art tracking susceptibility. Whereas uh, if you are solidifying directly into an authentic microstructure in this region, okay. Okay, so when uh, you primarily solidify a liquid into austenite, um, uh, the, the solubility of sulfur in austenite is much lower than solubility of uh, sulfur in ferrite. So the, the sulfur can uh, get uh, rotation to the liquid when you are solidifying primarily to austenite, right? So uh, that may lead to enrichment of uh, sulfur in the uh, uh, unsolidified liquid or the solidification grind boundary uh, and leading to cracking, uh, not cracking. Uh, self-induced uh, art cracking. So the one of the precautions you need to make sure that you, you choose a, a filler and generally for welding uh, um, uh, stainless steels we always uh, choose a low, low nickel filler. Okay so the low nickel filler is preferred because uh, the solidification mode would be primarily ferrite and subsequently you can uh, based on the phase diagrams uh, you can stabilize austenite. Okay so we'll move on to the, the next question in the chat. So the question from Mr. Karunagaran, could you please explain why the change in grind size at edges are like fine and coarse grinds, okay. Uh, so this is uh, as a function of peak temperatures, okay. So, so basically if you have a, a weld overview, so I've been teaching, you know, in uh, the, all the lectures, the peak temperature change as a function of distance from weld center line, right. So, so this is distance. And this is temperature. Okay. So when uh, the temperature uh, uh, at the uh, say uh, uh, near the fusion boundary, obviously it's at the fusion boundary, and uh, temperature goes beyond melting point. Okay. So this is melting point, for example, and then uh, temperature decreases when you move away from the fusion boundary. Okay. So this is the temperature. So obviously, when you have uh, regions uh, uh, in the heat effect zone where the temperature reached to much higher, uh, close to a melting point, uh, so you'll have a grind coarsening. So why the grind co uh, becomes coarser at higher temperature? So obviously, grind boundaries are defects. Okay. So defects means they have uh, an energy, uh, and this energy is obviously has to be minimized. Okay. So the system, when you give an driving force in function of temperature. Uh, the smaller grinds uh, becomes a bigger grind. It is same as uh, when you are playing with the bubbles, okay? Or uh, even if you look at uh, the bubbles in the water, okay, when you see the smaller bubble is there, there is a bigger bubble close to uh, next to the smaller bubble. And you may see that in a smaller bubble will be consumed by the bigger bubble and the bigger bubble becomes even bigger. Okay, so so the, uh, the, the fundamental thermodynamics behind this process is to, so minimizing the surface area, surface energy. Okay, so when you're given a chance, uh, any metal or any alloy would also do the do the uh, uh, similar behavior like you see in, uh, in the water or any other uh, uh, material. And so the smaller grinds uh, uh, would be consumed by the bigger grinds, and the bigger grinds would start growing because the the grind boundaries are energetic area. So the system has to minimize the energy uh, uh, by re reducing grind boundary area, grind boundary uh, surface, and system can minimize the energy. So obviously, when you give uh, temperature, uh, when you temp give heat energy. Uh, the grinds would uh, uh, become uh, coarser. Okay, so that is why you have uh, uh, grind coarsening when the temperature is higher. Okay, and then when you move along, uh, uh, move away from the fusion boundary towards the base material, so you may also have some uh, fine grind, uh, grind refinement may also take place. Um, so that is due to uh, an ion carbon system. Uh, uh, if you look at uh, the ion carbon diagram in the, in the ductile region, Okay, so recall uh, the ion carbon diagram. So this is carbon and temperature. Okay. Okay. And if the temperature has reached in between uh, 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 in uh, uh, the A3 and A1, so you have a, a grind refinement. Because uh, in this case, so if you are starting with an ferritic palladic microstructure. Okay, so this is for example, so this is alpha and, and this is perlite. And these the perlite grain will, will transform to the austenite when the temperature is reached between the A1 uh, and A3. And you will end up nucleating a lot of austenite grains. And this perlite region will end up nucleating uh, more austenitic grains. When the temperature is reached, 
to the intercritical region and subsequently when you cool back uh, the regions uh, where the peak temperature is reached uh, between a1 and a3 and uh, this austenite would transform to let's say the martensite or some other low temperature product so suppose if it is transforming into uh, martensite so so you have uh, multiple grinds of martensite forming from the uh, previous pellet grind and in this case you'll end up uh, refining the grind size because when the temperature is reached uh, between a1 and a3 in the intercritical temperature you nucleate more austenite uh, grinds subsequently when you cool back and uh, these austenite grinds would be transforming into martensite or pellite and uh, that will lead to the grind refinement okay um, so the mr kishnam raju also asked a question about uh, welding of high alloyed steels um, i mean you can't generalize uh, you know high alloyed steels okay so uh, each composition has a unique uh, characteristics uh, so th the welding metallurgy uh, of these steels are extremely complex okay so we'll have to look at a uh, case specific or composition specific welding metallurgy um, so yeah the silent steel uh, for example i explained uh, the choose of i mean carefully choosing uh, uh, the solidification mode uh, we can also avoid some of the problems uh, and of course we also need to have uh, um, a proper uh, post weld uh, thermal cycles uh, measured or uh, applied in order to uh, get a, a good weld microstructures anyway that's beyond the, uh, the objective of this course so maybe in future uh, we may offer a, a, a welding metallurgy course there we can discuss in detail okay so there's another question from mr ujwal kumar uh, he asked one uh, very general question uh, is this welding is similar like normal welding or different so it is like an uh, yeah, as similar as you can get to a normal welding uh, process okay um, so uh, if there is no other uh, question Okay, so uh, okay, so then uh, we'll continue uh, with uh, discussions on uh, assignment four, okay, which we didn't discuss in uh, last uh, live session. So if there are no other questions, uh, maybe we can move on. So okay, uh, there is one question now popping up uh, from Mr. Sachin Jambale. Okay. Um, the question is about uh, what is the best method to consider shear area and calculate tensile shear strength for spot weld. See, um, so generally when you are measuring the uh, tensile shear stress, so we'll have to uh, uh, use uh, a thumb rule, okay, so which I already talked about. The well nugget size should be uh, four times. So remember the lecture I showed you. Maybe I can uh, just pick up a slide uh, when you are looking at uh, that. So the well nugget size is very important, right? So first we'll have to generate the well growth curve, right? And then identify the acceptable uh, the well nugget diameter. Okay, so well nugget diameter, uh, an acceptable uh, well nugget diameter in spot welding case. Uh, so generally it's 4.2 or four times uh, thickness, isn't it? Square root. So these, uh, the tensile shear stress are generally carried out um, at the, uh, sorry, so this is four times square root of thickness. So that is the uh, thumb rule generally uh, used in automotive industry. So when you uh, want to test the weld, so you'll have to test the weld at an acceptable weld nugget size. So you have to identify uh, the first well growth curves the well growth curves means uh, as a current as a function of uh, well nugget diameter uh, 
okay the current as well like a diameter and then uh, you may uh, get uh, the uh, the imax and then you will have a graph something like that and identify at what uh, current uh, uh, for a given welding time, uh, you, uh, you generate a uh, uh, well nugget size of four times the square root of thickness. Uh, and then you can carry out uh, the tensile shear test in that weld. Right? So th that is the most uh, um, uh, ideal, uh, acceptable uh, testing conditions uh, automotive industries really use. Okay. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, so then uh, we'll uh, move on to the uh, the assignment four. Okay, it's in aluminium containing uh, the first question. So, uh, the assignment four in aluminium containing advanced ice and steel, which metallurgical reaction occurs first when the well pole is formed? Okay, uh, so uh, the answer is obvious answer is uh, the formation of oxide inclusions because uh, the oxide inclusion formation temperature is as a as uh, 2400 uh, Kelvin. Okay, so the first reaction which is going to control, which you're going to, which you're going to affect the, the microstructure development is the, the oxide inclusions. Uh, so that is the answer, answer B. Uh, the second question in uh, uh, assignment four is that delta ferrite gets stabilized in fusion and grain boundaries in trip steel wells by, okay, so the answer is uh, an aluminum. Okay, so aluminum is the only alloying element uh, in the uh, trip steel. Uh, which can partition to the, uh, the uh, delta ferrite when it solidifies. Okay, of course, sulfur, but we don't add sulfur uh, intensely. So once the aluminium uh, enriches, so obviously, you know, if you look at aluminium iron aluminium phase diagram, if aluminium concentration goes beyond 1.2 in pure aluminium, which I also showed in the lectures, uh, uh, the delta ferrite stabilizes. And then the, the third question. The primary nucleation site for acicular ferrite is, so the answer is uh, non-metallic inclusions. Okay, so why uh, uh, this is important because when you have uh, an acicular ferrite microstructure containing microstructure, the well metal toughness increases significantly. So uh, uh, yeah, the uh, in a welding metallurgy point of view, having an uh, acicular ferrite microstructure is beneficial. So because you get a, a, a very good toughness and acceptable uh, ductility. Uh, therefore, uh, no, having a uh, controlled distribution of non-metallic inclusions can be very useful uh, because these non-metallic inclusions can act as a nucleation site uh, for uh, acicular ferrite and uh, when austenite transforms uh, while subsequently cooling to room temperature apart solidification. Okay, so the question number uh, four, and the, which one of the following elements is known to minimize phosphorus segregation of the central line? So this is a straightforward answer uh, which we discussed in uh, in detail uh, during the lectures. Uh, the answer is boron. Okay, so the the effect of boron and uh, minimizing the segregation is uh, is studied and. Uh, uh, it is also reported in the extensive league. Uh, so the boron uh, is the uh, one of the fastest diffusing alloying elements uh, next to carbon. Okay, so next only to carbon. Uh, so boron readily diffuses the uh, the austenite grain boundaries uh, uh, and uh, solidification grain boundaries uh, uh, during solidification. So the moment the boron segregates to the grain boundary uh, and it uh, the stops the phosphorus atoms and reach the grain boundary. So thereby we can minimize the phosphorus induced uh, grain boundary embrittlement. Okay. Then the question number five, which one of the following element uh, following elements diffuse out of liquid to solid during solidification of trip steel? Okay, so uh, so this question is related to the uh, the, uh, the question uh, uh, number two. Uh, yeah. so the answer is um, aluminium, and uh, uh, so you may also say that in this case uh, sulfur as well. Uh, so you can say the answer uh, of aluminium and sulfur, both of them are correct. And even if you mention aluminium in this case, uh, we gave uh, the marks. And then uh, the uh, question number six, which one of the following microstructural constituents in steel is paramagnetic at room temperature? 
So this also we discussed in detail. Uh, the question number six, uh, and the two phases uh, and which are paramagnetic uh, in the, the chill microstructure at room temperature are austenite and the non-metallic inclusions. Okay, so the question number seven, when the retained austenite fraction increases, the saturation magnetization of trip steel. Uh, so when uh, the paramagnetic component increases, obviously the saturation magnetization decreases. So that is also, uh, uh, I explained in detail, uh, the effect of uh, uh, the paramagnetic component in the saturation magnetization. So I'm back to uh, the screen. So the question number seven, the when the retained austenite fraction increases, the saturation magnetization of trip steel uh, decreases. Okay, so because we are increasing the paramagnetic component, uh, it uh, can reduce the uh, saturation magnetization. And then uh, question number eight, the width of the heat affected zone in well trip steel is generally uh, larger than conventional uh, heat affected zones uh, in uh, low carbon steels. So that is because of uh, the decomposition of retained austenite. Because, so uh, we also looked at the thermal stability of it in last night while heating. So when the temperature is uh, uh, reached even to a temperature of 290, 300 degrees centigrade, uh, we saw the retained last night could decompose to uh, ferrite uh, and ancimatite uh, uh, with the uh, transition uh, carbide formation. Uh, and uh, because of that, you know, when uh, uh, in the heat of the zone, even the temperature is uh, just about uh, 200 to 300 degrees centigrade. So you may expect uh, the decomposition of it in last night. In conventional uh, low carbon steels, uh, you see minimal effect when the temperature is reached uh, say 200 degrees centigrade. Whereas in trip steel, uh, uh, because of the presence of it in last night, uh, so you see a softening. It's happening uh, because of formation of ferrite and uh, uh, the, uh, the transient carbides. The question number nine, the softening of heat of the zone in welded uh, dual phase steels. So dual phase steels, uh, the microstructure is ferritic martensitic. Uh, so obviously, so when uh, the martensite containing microstructure is heated up, martensite tempers, and that leads to uh, uh, softening in the heat affected zone. And then question number 10, the double pulsing resistance part weld thermal cycle improved the mechanical properties of the weld by, so this we just discussed uh, while answering uh, the question of uh, Mr. Karnagaran. Uh, so we uh, apply the second uh, pulsing uh, to homogenize the elemental segregation, right? So this also we discussed in detail uh, during uh, lecture hours as well. Right, so so with this, uh, now we complete uh, the assignment four discussions, and uh, so if you have any any other questions, uh, uh, please feel free to you know uh, uh, post it. Well, there is another question uh, from Mr. Karunagaran. Uh, if you do welding in the control atmosphere like cryo, is it possible to control automatic inclusions? Of course. So that is one way of. Uh, uh, control in the non-metallic inclusion formation. It is very regularly done, even in our, our laboratory, you know, when you are doing in a very sensitive alloys, uh, we generally weld inside the glove box. And in, uh, in some of the very sensitive applications, for example, defense and aerospace uh, welding, uh, so I can't tell, you know, where we actually do it. And uh, in India also, uh, for some of the defense applications, uh, so we also weld uh, uh, the entire room uh, filled in argon. Okay, so the entire uh, the welding uh, room itself uh, is, is like a glove box. So the welders would go with a uh, complete chute with oxygen cylinder, and then they go inside and do the welding in order to control uh, uh, the atmosphere of the weld, uh, so that you know we we avoid the uh, non-metal inclusion formation. In um, some of these uh, sensitive uh, <coughs> materials, uh, when you're uh, we really have to control the microstructures and inclusions, for example. Uh, we can uh, weld it in a, in a glove box, for example. That is possible. 
So uh, now um, we are almost uh, there uh, at the end. So if, if you have any other questions, uh, you may um, post it in the live chat. Otherwise, uh, you know, you're also you know, welcome to ask me uh, in by email. So the forum would be active for some more time uh, in the course uh, forum, one more week. Yeah, so we'll keep it an uh, active. And the, uh, the course has been uh, already completed. And if you are not submitted assignment four, I think the deadline is also over. So probably uh, yeah, we, we will uh, expect you, know, you in the in the end semester, the end course exams. So the end course exam, uh, the question pattern is all of them are uh, multiple choice questions. Okay, so it would be similar to what uh, I asked in assignments. Okay, um, so uh, I wish you good luck. Uh, if you have a further questions, and you can just ask. We'll wait for uh, say a few minutes, and then we we'll line up. So I hope you know this course is is useful uh, to you, um, uh, especially the the people who are working in automotive industry. Uh, the welding of advanced ice and steels uh, uh, and the use of advanced ice and steels uh, in uh, the automotive application is going to go uh, tremendously because of uh, the large potential it offers in weight, light weighting. So light weighting is, uh, is uh, much needed uh, uh, to improve the, the fuel efficiency. Uh, and the, Almost all the automotive industries are all uh, now talking about reducing the weight of the automotive vehicles. So. Uh, so one way of uh, doing it is you know, to use advanced ice and steels. So yeah, make yourself comfortable. Uh, so these videos will also be available online. And if you have any other questions, you know, you're also feel free to you know, uh, drop an email. Uh, or uh, if you're coming uh, to IIT, and then just drop an email if you want to meet us. Uh, you can also please uh, drop by uh, with uh, prayer intimation. Okay, so any other questions? Uh, Okay, so if not, I uh, will wind up here. And uh, yeah, good luck with your uh, work, uh, your studies, uh, and uh, enjoy. Good. Of course, uh, so someone asked about I had a lunch or something like that. No, I haven't had. I will go and have. Good. Thanks. Okay. Okay, so Mr. Sachin asked uh, the brief about residual stress developed. Okay, it can be uh, a, a, a one semester course, residual stress development. Okay, so if you want to get a brief idea about residual stress, residual stress are developing because of inhomogeneity in uh, two. So one by uh, inhomogeneity in thermal expansion, and then uh, the stresses that are developing during phase transformation. So you know, imagine in thermal expansion, you may expect because the, when the peak temperatures are reached uh, in the heat of the zone, they are not the same. So they vary as a function of the central line. So material would expand uh, at a different uh, 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 magnitude at various locations in, in the heat of the zone and the well zone. So for example, uh, material, uh, uh, the microstructure close to the fusion boundary, the temperature is as high as a melting point. Uh, in uh, the fine grained heat of its zone, as I explained, the temperature would be in the intercritical region. So the expansion, uh, the magnitude of expansion would be different in these two regions, but they are all in a, in a, in a homogenized material. Okay, They are in mechanical equilibrium. So when the one area is expanding more, the other area is expanding less. So the, these, the expansions would be accommodated. And that's how we have uh, a new strain in heat of its zone. Uh, in the, the well zone, um, obviously, when you have a solidification happens, uh, so the material, uh, the, the well microstructure, when it solidifies, uh, it contracts, okay? Because liquid has more volume. When the liquid solidifies, the solid uh, volume decreases and, and lead to the solidification shrinkage. Um, so that means that you know, the, when this well metal solidify, uh, it is trying to shrink, but system is in mechanical equilibrium, so fusion boundary cannot the heat of the zone cannot let the well to go away by shrinkage. So the uh, um, heat of the zone should apply in a tensile stress. 
in order to uh, compensate the compressive stresses that are generated uh, by uh, the solidification shrinkage. Okay. Similarly, uh, when subsequently the well metal uh, cools down, the vast night turns out to Martin side, there is also no volume expansion. Okay. So these inhomogeneities in thermal expansion and the phase transmission uh, volume uh, shrinkage and the expansion uh, would lead to the residual stress generation. Then only we classify residual stress into three types, type one, type two, and type three. Okay. So type one, one is a macroscopic stress. And macroscopic stress is a result of type two and type three stress. And type three stress is in the planar level, okay, in the, in the crystal level. Uh, uh, and these stresses are generated uh, because of uh, inhomogeneity in the planar uh, mechanical properties. Okay, uh, and the type two stresses are generated at the grind level. And if you have multiphase microstructure, this is a ferrite and martensite mixture. Similarly, uh, like in a, in a as a function of temperature, uh, different phases would also have a different thermal expansion uh, behavior. Okay, so then if you have ferrite and martensite uh, grinds. Uh, embedded in a microstructure, um, the mutton side would expand differently than ferrite because of the change in composition. And that will also lead to the residual stress generation. And generally, the phase specific or grain specific, uh, uh, um, uh, the residual stress is generally known as uh, uh, type 2 stress. And type 3 and type 2 stress combine uh, form a type 1 microscopic stress. Um, See, uh, the, the stability retained last night, uh, uh, it is uh, as a function of uh, the change in chemical potential uh, as in, uh, with respect to the alloying elements, okay? So, so uh, the aluminum, so, so when you are added uh, in, a, in a trip steel, the local, uh, the, uh, the, the energy state, uh, which is determined by the chemical composition, Okay, so suppose if you have an aluminium uh, rich uh, trip steel uh, retained last night, uh, would be enriched in aluminium. So uh, then change in the, the chemical uh, potential would lead to the change in stability. And moreover, in uh, uh, aluminium based trip steels, the retained last night, so what you generally find, they are all uh, blocky, the bigger in size. Okay. Uh, so there is also no, the, the stability uh, by the effect of uh, sizes. So th there is a chemical stability given by the thermodynamics and the chemical potential. And there is also mechanical stability given by the size of it in night. So generally in a trip steel uh, containing aluminum, aluminum containing strip steel, uh, uh, the presence of a blocky in night fraction is higher. And if you have a blocky in night, you expect uh, uh, the mechanical stability uh, to go down than the, the interloth uh, uh, osnide, which you expect uh, when you have a silicon in the retained osnide. Okay. Okay, so the, the stability is arising from two factors, chemical stability and the mechanical stability. Good. So we'll wait uh, one more minute, a couple of minutes, and then uh, we'll uh, wind up. So. Can you be the next class? No, the classes are over. Um, so we'll uh, see. Next semester, uh, so uh, probably we may also offer an, a, a course on uh, building processes. Uh, so where we are trying to talk about uh, the physics of uh, welding, uh, both in experimental uh, the as well as the modeling. That will be more advanced course on welding processes. So if there are no more questions, we'll end up here. Thank you uh, for uh, coming uh, in uh, Sunday morning. Uh, so I hope you had a, a fruitful uh, session and uh, you enjoyed the course. Um, yeah, please feel, feel free to uh, contact us for uh, any clarifications further. <laughs>
Thank you.